Okay, this is Unit 1, Matter and Measurement, and this is Lesson 1. Today we're going to talk about different types of matter, how we can classify matter, and we're going to look at drawing particle diagrams. First I want to point out on the first page of your note packet is some important vocabulary that you will need to know for this unit. The vocabulary is found on Quizlet.com. Okay, so you can access the vocabulary by going to Quizlet.com and typing in my name, J. Nielsen. And then you should see the class for Regents Chemistry and Unit 1 vocabulary. There will be a vocabulary quiz on each unit. So let's get started. Matter. What is matter? Well, matter is anything that has mass and volume. So matter has mass and volume. You're going to write this in on your note packet. And if it has mass and volume, then it means it takes up space. There are two ways we can talk about matter. First, we have matter that cannot be separated by physical means. And then we have matter that can be separated by physical means. So matter that cannot be separated through a physical means, meaning evaporation, filtration, um, some new things we might talk about, distillation. You've talked about chromatography in living environment. Those things that cannot be separated by those physical means are called pure substances. And I'm sure that you're very familiar with one pure substance um, is water. And when we talk about a pure substance, each piece looks the same, no matter what part we examine. It's going to look the same. They have, it has the exact same composition. Now we compare that to matter that can be separated by physical means, we're talking about mixtures of substances. Mixtures. I can separate the salt from salt water by heating it. The water will evaporate and the salt will be left behind. So in a mixture, each piece is different. If I had a mixture of sand and water, that's a mixture. But the pieces of water are different from the pieces of sand. So we can separate that. So let's take this further. In talking about pure substances, those that cannot be separated by physical means, we can further divide that. Those, out of those pure substances, some of them can be separated by chemical means only, and some cannot be separated by physical means. Those that cannot be separated by physical means are elements. Elements cannot be broken down. They are in the simplest form of matter. and I'm going to put in parentheses, cannot be broken down. And some examples of elements, well, sodium, and let's see, chlorine gas, and oxygen gas. 
those that can be separated by chemical means, we're talking about compounds. Or we could be talking about a molecule. And I'll explain the difference. Compounds are two or more different elements chemically combined. So if they're chemically combined, then we can separate them by physical means. And some examples, NaCl, which is sodium chloride, that's the salt that you put on your food, your french fries, and water. If you don't want to remember this, you can put salt underneath. So I might have a compound, um, sodium chloride, or I could have a molecule of water. Molecules, when we talk about molecules, we're usually talking about non-metals and that's kind of going into another unit but we'll, we'll come back to this later on and be more um, give more examples of that. So on the other side remember we had matter that which cannot be separated which is our pure substances which we just talked about elements that cannot be broken down com compounds which can be broken down by chemical means on the other side of matter we have that matter that can be separated by physical means mixtures when we talk about a mixture we have mixtures that have the same composition throughout and that's referred as homogeneous mixture and an easy way to remember homogeneous is the prefix homo. The prefix homo means same. So a homogeneous mixture is uniform throughout. An example of this could be salt water. This would be, again, uh, salt water. If I take table salt and I dissolve it in water, and this is written as NaCl with an AQ after it for aqueous, meaning with water, and um, another example could just from every day could be iced tea. If you take iced tea mix and you mix it with water and you stir it until it completely dissolves it's homogeneous it's uniform throughout on the flip side of that if we have a different composition the mixture is then called heterogeneous and the prefix hetero means different And I'm sure that you can think of some other words that begin with these prefixes. Homo sapien, meaning same man. Homosexual and heterosexual. So same and different. So that's an easy way to help you remember it. So this is a mixture that is not uniform. throughout. What did I do over here? I didn't write the word throughout. I put, made my own word. Hopefully somebody caught that. Throughout. Okay. And some examples of that might be an easy one that you can relate to is chocolate chip cookie dough. You are not guaranteed to get the same number of chocolate chips in each spoon of cookie dough. Italian salad dressing that's made with 
vinegar, oil, water, and spices, that is not consistent throughout. Okay, let's move on to particle diagrams. In the first one, we're drawing a particle diagram of an element. If I just had sodium, which is what's called a monoatomic element, I'm going to go a little ahead here. Sodium, which is Na, is monatomic, means that it's made up of one atom. These could be sodium atoms. If I had, let's say, O2, oxygen, that, what we breathe. Oxygen is written as what's called diatomic. In order for it to exist in nature, there must be two of the same atoms connected together. So this would be a diatomic molecule. And I'm going to talk about this later, but there are actually seven diatomic molecules on the periodic table. And they are Br, I, N, C, L, H, O, F. Brinkelhoff. That's the easiest way to remember them. And these seven stand for, I'll put them underneath, bromine. I'm not expecting you to know these right now. I'm introducing them now so that when we do learn them, you'll have heard them before and be like, oh, that's right. Nielsen talked about those. Chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Okay, so that's a particle diagram for either a monatomic element or diatomic. Now, compounds, two or more different. Let's just do water. Water is H2O. So we know that water is made up of two H's and one O. So we've got two H's connected to an oxygen. So this could be a particle diagram for water. They have to be connected because it's a compound. Okay, homogeneous mixture, uniform throughout. So a mixture implies two different things. So let's say that we had, here's your H2Os, and maybe there's some salt in there, NaCl. So we can do this. So that would be considered a homogeneous mixture. There's evenly distributed two of each. Now a heterogeneous has no uniformity whatsoever. So we could have this, we could have this, we could have this, we could have this, okay, there's no, there's no uniformity. I've got multiple of some, single of others. The last thing that we're going to talk about are properties of matter. Physical properties are the constants about a substance. It's things that we can observe with our senses. Touch, see, hear, smell, it does not require chemical analysis. For example, we have two types of physical properties, an extensive property and an intensive property. An extensive property is a property that depends on how much of the material you are dealing with. If I have a lot of something, then the mass will change. If I have a lot of something, the amount of heat it absorbs or gives off will change. If I have change the amount of something, then the amount of energy it produces will change. These physical properties, mass, heat, and energy are all physical properties, depend upon how much I have of the substance. Whereas an intensive 
property is a property that does not depend on how much material you are dealing with. It helps identify the matter. You can think of it as something specific to that substance. So I'm going to write that over here, specific to the substance. For example, melting point. So the melting point of sugar is not the same as the melting point of water or the melting point of alcohol, and therefore also the boiling point. It's specific to the substance. The color, density, hardness, you talked about that in earth science, and solubility. How much of the substance will dissolve in a given amount of water? Chemical properties include behaviors substances adhere to when they react with other substances. For example, when I react hydrogen, H2, because it's part of Brinklehoff gas, with oxygen, O2, because it's part of Brinklehoff gas, this results in a combustion reaction. So let's just do some guided practice. We're going to identify as being intensive, specific to the substance. Extensive, does it rely on how much I have or a chemical property? Another way to think of a chemical property is a new substance is created. Like when I burn paper, I can't get the paper back. It turns into carbon ash. So the mass of a copper wire is 255 grams. Will that change depending on if I change the amount of copper I have? Yes, it will. So this would be extensive. We'll put an E. The boiling point of ethyl alcohol is 77 degrees. Is that intensive, extensive, or chemical? Hopefully you said it was intensive because it's specific for ethyl alcohol. Not every substance has the same boiling point. Baking soda reacts with vinegar to make carbon dioxide gas. Can I get my baking soda back? No, I'm creating a new substance here, so this is chemical. The density of mercury is 13.6. Well, density changes depending on the substance, so this would be intensive and the solubility of sodium chloride in water is 40 grams per milliliter. So that's specific to sodium chloride, so that's intensive. Okay, this ends the first lesson. Tomorrow we'll continue with examples of physical and chemical changes.